Well, hey everybody, good day, this is Joe, welcome back to the channel. Well, what do you think I have here? Yes, you're right, it's a typewriter. What kind of typewriter is it? Well, do you recognize the case, huh? Hmm? A little clasp like that on the front? Well, actually, this is not a new typewriter to my collection. You've actually seen this one before, because this is the Groma Calibri. Stay tuned. The Groma Calibri is one of those typewriters that has gained a lot of notoriety and attention in the typosphere. It is at times a highly sought after machine because of its slender profile. It is probably one of the shortest typewriters. A close second would be the uh, Hermes Rocket Baby. And of course the uh, Roy, the French made folding Roy, is actually uh, narrower than this in its folded position, but when it's unfolded that it's taller than this machine, of course. So uh, one of the things that amazed me or impressed me about the, the Groma Calibri was the build quality. I am a child of the Cold War. I was born in 1957. I grew up in the United States in the 1960s and 70s. And in the United States, we were propagandized about the Soviet bloc and the Eastern bloc about their quality of their workmanship and their products and all that. But I got to tell you that uh, this machine actually surprised me with its quality and what they did to fit what they have done into such a small package. It really is remarkable, considering also the aesthetics of the machine, right? If you think of the Western propaganda of brutalist communist architecture and engineering. No, this is there's nothing brutalist about this design. This is a beautiful little bird of a typewriter. And uh, I am sure those of you who have collected these and used these probably would agree with me that's one of the prettier mid-century design of typewriters. Well, you've probably known about the Groma Calibri if you have been a typewriter collector at all. And you might know that it was probably brought into prominence first by the movie The Lives of Others. And if you haven't seen The Lives of Others, that's a great film. Go out and check it out. But this particular machine ended up at Shop Goodwill Online, kind of a competitor to eBay, if you will. My friend Kevin bought this from Shop Goodwill a couple years ago. It had several issues. It had a loud clanking noise when you typed, but more seriously, it really had a nagging skipping issue. And he originally brought it over to me maybe over a year ago, year and a half ago, to look at. And I was able to quiet down the clanking noise a little bit but the skipping problem kind of remained. It kind of came and went. It was a little bit better, sometimes a little worse. I found that my particular touch or typing style is a lighter touch, and I could actually, on a hard surface, a rigid tabletop, I could get it to type almost a whole page without any skipping. But as soon as Kevin got a hold of it with his heavy-handedness, the way he types, the thing would start skipping more. So I knew that I had to be a little bit more diligent in how I tested this. Well. Time passed, and eventually Kevin gave me the typewriter, and what a great gift it was. So this was my first Groma Calibri. The noise it makes when it types wasn't quite as serious to me as the real problem, which is the intermittent skipping problem. And uh, I did quite a bit to try to diagnose it. I thought at various times that I had the problem licked. Like, for instance, one of the problems was the letter A key. The type bar or the key just felt like very low spring pressure or not as heavy of a spring pressure as the other keys. And it was skipping oftentimes right after I would type the letter A when I was touch typing. So I thought, well, maybe the letter A, the spring tension needs to be increased. So I did uh, adjust that spring. I pulled it out and hooked it up on a little different part of the spring, so it's a little more tense. I also noticed the same thing about the H key. It would skip a little bit after the H, and its spring tension felt a little weak, and so I had adjusted its spring. But it ended up, that wasn't really the fix. So a few months ago, when we, uh, when Kevin and I were up in the uh, mountains, the Sandia Mountain Wilderness, in, in one of our picnics that we've been doing this summer, I brought this machine along figuring, oh, this would make a great picnic typewriter, right? Nice, small, portable, has its own little case. 
Well, we had these plastic folding uh, tables that we were using, and as soon as I started typing with this typewriter on the table, the table surface had a certain flex and bounce to it. As soon as I started typing, this thing skipped worse than any machine I've ever seen. It would just skip really super bad. So while on the one hand I was disappointed about that, on the other hand, it kind of pointed me in to the direction of where the solution might lie. So one of the keys to diagnosing this problem was that I never had any skipping with the space bar itself. It was always only when typing the keys themselves. And so examining the escapement mechanism, there is an escapement rocker arm that is actuated on one side by the space bar mechanism and it's actuated on the other side by the key operation. And so I knew that that escapement rocker arm was okay. It itself was okay. It has its own spring tension, but it wasn't skipping after spaces. So that came down to there is a crescent-shaped part that's underneath the segment here. Whenever a key is hit, the underneath part of those linkages presses that crescent-shaped bar and it moves and it pushes on a little plate that's riding in and out on a pin and that is what operates that other side of the escapement rocker. And that has its own spring. Its spring is buried down in there. It was on a pin that was uh, in the casting and it looked like from my skill level and confidence, um, I was not going to attempt to disassemble all of that and try to increase the spring tension. Instead, I had to find a way to add additional spring tension to that system externally. This is the escapement rocker itself that pivots back and forth and it's activated by the space bar like this from the left side here and then it's activated on the right side by typing a character key via this plate that pushes back and forth when the linkages up here come near to the print position they will push this flat plate in and out uh, off of this stud here. And so once I deduced that this plate's motion uh, was too loose and too springy, causing, I believe, the skipping issue, uh, then I had to figure out how can I dampen the motion of that plate. Well, first of all, right up here, that you might be able to see the right end of a coil spring. It's actually a torsion spring. There's a shaft that runs through this bracket and that bracket. Anyways, you have to take this whole big plate off to get to it. Um, that has something to do with the tension on this. But because the, the pin is press fit into here, uh, it's really difficult to get out. So I had to come up with an alternative way of um, adding more spring pressure or springiness to this plate as it moves via the type bar linkages. And what I did is I found a piece of spring steel in my metal bin and this is probably like a shield off of some electronic module in, that I got sometime in the past but it has a kind of a spring quality to it so I uh, cut off the end of it right here and that's what this piece is right here and I affixed it with hot glue to this bracket right here and what's important about this is that this is a carriage shift machine and so in the shifted position like this, the relationship will of this spring to this sliding piece to this spring piece will remain constant, regardless whether it's in a lowercase or uppercase position. I had considered uh, mounting some kind of a spring like over here, like for instance, this is a metric screw that I added. There is a sp couple spare holes here, here and here. I was going to stick this metric screw in here and have some kind of a little leaf spring that comes over to hit that and provide more springiness, but it wouldn't really work because in the uppercase versus lowercase, the distance from here to here changes, right? So um, anyway, whatever spring I was able to put on, it had to be mounted to this same bracket that's part of the uh, uh, chassis itself. So 
I did put some hot glue there, and so far the tests I've done uh, this spring has provided adequate pressure, adequate springiness to dampen the movement of this uh, from being too loose, while at the same time it still provides full motion of it during the full stroke of the keys. So I am interested somewhat in this whole question of how do you fix a problem like this and is it the right way to fix the problem by instead of addressing the root cause of the tension of a certain spring is because of the difficulty of accessing that adding your own spring to it to increase the tension. That's an interesting question. I think uh, in my mind, at least because it's my own machine, I think it satisfies me as a valid repair. It certainly addresses the issue and it makes the machine usable. Now, if I was doing this for a living, uh, selling my services to someone else and fixing someone else's machine, would I do that? Well, I don't know. I probably would and I would just tell them up front that I uh, had to figure out a way to address the problem because of the difficulty of otherwise doing it. So anyways, sometimes there are unconventional ways to deal with these, but the most important thing I think in this whole process for me was figuring out what the cause of the problem was. And again, it all came back down to that typing experience up in the mountains with the the bouncy table when the typewriter really started to misbehave and that pointed the way to the solution. So troubleshooting the problem and finding the cause is the key to the whole thing. I did some extensive testing and also testing not only on this hard table but on a bouncy surface. I actually sat in my couch. I had a cushion a pillow on my lap and I put the typewriter on top of the pillow. Uh, so typing on a bouncy cushiony surface haven't had one skip yet. Um, however, my experience with uh, typewriters has been that oftentimes when you have an intermittent skipping problem, you don't want to call or claim success until only after enough time has passed where you've used the machine enough that you can confidently say it isn't going to skip. I think I'm 90% confident that it's okay now. Uh, it remains to be seen if that little uh, spring metal that I hot glue gunned in place, maybe the glue will come loose and I might have to like epoxy it instead which is what I probably might do. I'll probably go ahead and put some epoxy on that to hold it in place better. On the left side of the carriage, of course, we have our carriage return lever, which has a little articulating spring loadedness to it so that it'll fit in its case better. The left platen knob, and it has a knob that can be loosened to adjust the line spacing variable. And this is a permanent variable adjustment. Uh, carriage return button on the left side, that's nice and handy. Line spacing selector between one and two, and it says one and two, but the single line spacing is two half spaces or half lines, and the two position is three half lines, so the number two is actually a space and a half setting, and that's common on a lot of European machines that I've seen. Okay, in the back here, the left margin setting, and it's basically push and slide like classic margin setting like a lot of others. Okay, the paper support pulls up like that into a vertical position and it's stored like that. On the right rear of the carriage, of course, you have the right margin setting, which is a push and slide setting also, and actually this one is easy to get it flipped like that. So. It will do that if the screws are loose. So anyway, it's a push and slide like that. Um, the paper bale has a nice finger on the right side of it. There is a little scale of markings, of line spacing markings. There's no numbering, however, just index marks. And it has two small but rubber-coated uh, rollers for the paper bale. And then, of course, the right-hand uh, carriage release button, the paper release lever right here, and the right platen knob. And then down here on the right side below the right platen 
area is the ribbon reversing selector. So you can manually reverse the, the ribbon. It does, however, have an automatic ribbon reversing system. Okay, I'm going to remove the ribbon cover. And so this is the uh, segment area. This is, of course, a carriage shift machine. It uses DIN size ribbon spools. And the ribbon reversing is done by the position of these two back tension arms. There's one on each side. They serve uh, one function is to keep the ribbon tightly packed. So if the spool gets loose, the ribbon won't spill out into the machine. Provide some back tension when this spool is serving as a uh, supply spool. but. What's also happening is the rotation of this arm rotates the shaft that it's mounted on and that will trip the ribbon reverse when it goes in far enough. What's interesting to note is if you put a different diameter spool or a different diameter hub to the spool or a significantly shorter ribbon, it probably won't reverse. You'll have to adjust it underneath because it, it's based on how far it rotates in as compared to the other arm for the reversing. Okay, so then your ribbon vibrator right here, there is no bichrome setting, okay, and it has these simple guides that the ribbon threads through, and then there are two little um, indexing or pencil guides for you can put a pencil or a pen in there and draw lines, and there is a typing scale, little indexed marks on either side of the print position right here. You'll notice on my machine there is a little bit of plating that has come off over the years on the ring here, the area where the tight bars will have their hard stop against the uh, ring there as they, at the print position. So a little bit of plating has worn off and that's indicative of just the age of the machine. Uh, you might notice that the tight bar rest here is actually a wire that has been secured at both ends with a screw and then it's covered in a rubber uh, tube as a type R rest and it works pretty well. I don't see any problem with sticking or anything. Now there's one feature here I wanted to point out to you when I first saw this machine and first took the cover off uh, because it's an ultra portable typewriter and I was thinking it would be a lot like a Hermes rocket or a, maybe a Smith Corona Skywriter in terms of its construction but this is a heavy thick cast alloy chassis. It is a unit chassis. It's not like a chassis with an outer thin sheet metal body panel. It's the chassis and the body is one piece. It's over th probably four millimeters thick at least of solid cast metal that's then machined to make these machined surfaces. So pretty impressive build quality considering the size of the typewriter, how thin it is. And uh, that's true of course if you see here on the other side as well. It is a very thick cast alloy chassis that has then been machined. So these little holes in the side brackets are the retaining holes for the springs for the ribbon cover. So the ribbon cover has two of these little spring-loaded little protrusions that help secure it in those slots when it fits into place. And I gotta say the sheet metal on the ribbon cover is quite heavy gauge. It's pretty impressive considering how small the typewriter is. I think without a doubt one of the most appealing aesthetic parts of the Groma Calibri is the raised molded or cast a logo and then the Groma logo here on the front. Just a beautiful example of mid-century design and of course the the lines of the machine. It's so beautiful and rounded and sleek looking along with its narrow uh, profile. It's just a wonderful looking machine. So I've made a lot of mention in the past about the 5 series Smith Corona typewriters like the Silent and Silent Super and how they have an articulating linkage on the key arms where the face of the key itself remains horizontal throughout the entire travel. And you might notice that the Groma Calibri has that same feature. The key face stays horizontal throughout the entire key travel. The only real difference uh, between this and the Smith Corona is the Smith Corona, the key makes a slight arc like this in its travel to follow the natural motion of one's finger as it makes that arc-like shape, whereas the Groma does uh, pretty much uh, straight down or a little 
bit of the opposite. Here's a closer detail shot from underneath the machine of looking at the type bar linkages and these articulating linkages that enables the face of the key to stay horizontal through its entire travel. So this is a keyboard designed for the American market, an international market, but of course it was designed and built in uh, communist East Germany. So it does not have a number one key, but it does have in place of it the exclamation and degree symbol, which I find very interesting. Actually, I find it kind of useful to have an exclamation mark uh, unshifted. It, it means I'll probably use it a little bit more often. And it's also very novel to have a degree symbol. I can't say I use it that often, but it actually makes a nice little symbol to separate phrases in, for instance, titles or headers. Um, so the rest of the keys are pretty much like an American style keyboard on this machine, including your typical quarter, half, fraction, cent, and at um, uh, symbol here. And uh, the rest of the keyboard is uh, very consistently an American design keyboard. The, uh, of course, backspace key is on the right side and the margin release key is on the left side above the shift lock. And of course, speaking of shifting, I mentioned this earlier, it is a carriage shift machine. It does have a pretty good size space bar, and I like the action of the space bar. It works pretty well. So here's the thing I really like the way they designed. This is one side of the space bar actuator bracket on the right side underneath the machine, and it has this interesting arm here that follows the shape of the body, and it comes over here to uh, articulate this linkage here, but it's just nice the way they follow the shape of the molding of the frame here for the spacebar bracket. So when I first started servicing this machine, uh, taking the bottom plate off, I had to first remove these uh, feet and their brackets. And I noticed originally the feet were mounted so that this shiny chrome plated side was facing toward the inside of the feet. So the other side of this molded foot bracket is not shiny chrome plated. It's more of a dull finish. So I suspect somebody has had this apart in the past and they mounted these feet backwards. And that was one of the problems with the way the bottom plate was mounted is the feet were mounted backwards because they are asymmetrical. And again, you can see the asymmetrical design of the feet bracket where this side is thicker than that side. And if you mount it the opposite way, not only will the chrome side be on the inside, but this wide part will be uh, risking rubbing against the plate and keeping you from reinstalling the plate properly. So I have the microphone placed right next to the machine so you can hear this better, but there is a slight back and forwards play to the carriage. This guide here is the guide that keeps the uh, carriage aligned during its shifting uh, between uppercase and lowercase, but there's a little bit of space in there. And when you type, this carriage will move back and forth and make a slight clicky noise due to the spring tension of the spring motor. And it's just one of the things that contributes to, for it to have a slight clanky sound when you type. I have attempted to put a two mil thick brass shim in this little space and it did reduce that clanky sound but it also risks binding the carriage when it's shifting between the upper and lower case and so I took that uh, shim off uh, but uh, I think it's just part of the uh, machine here is the clankiness is just part of the way it's made and there's not a whole lot of room for soundproofing. While we're looking in here you can see the set screws for adjusting the upper and lower case shifting and there's individual sets of these set screws on either side. So in spite of the smallness and slenderness of the design they did make an attempt to put some soundproofing felt wherever they could. Here's an example of it on the rear panel of the carriage. There's some thin soundproofing. So an attempt was made to do that. You can see the glue is starting to come loose. I'm going to have to reattach some of these pieces. Another thing that I thought was impressive about this typewriter is the quality of the case. So it's a leather case or leatherette. I don't really know if it's real leather with a plastic vinyl handle. This one's showing a little bit of rust uh, signs. It's had some wear in its day. It has a nice secure clasp, however and the case uh, pulls open like that. I'd say it's built a lot better than maybe an Olivetti Lettera 22 case, and those are notorious, of course, for having issues with uh, the zippers rotting out. So it has two metal studs here, and those will uh, align with 
the holes in the bottom of the typewriter feet so you can easily set the typewriter in there and it'll lock it into place or at least it'll set it into place in a fixed position in the case like that. Uh, there is no real carriage lock on the machine actually so you're just basically going to ensure that the, uh, the knobs are centered and then of course close up the lid like that and secure it and it works quite fine. Uh, one of the things I also like about the, the, the case here is this nice little document pouch in the back and uh, I actually keep a little typing pad back here you can put some typing paper or whatever it has a nice little snap and so yeah pretty nicely thought out there's room for a uh, documents back there and this makes it a grab-and-go typewriter all its own you got room for typing paper correction tape correction tabs or whatever even a little pocket dictionary or a thesaurus you might be able to stick back in there so it's a pretty handy little little case I'm actually pretty impressed with it and once you lock it like that it uh, is a pretty nice little package it uh, looks a very much mid 20th century and uh, kind of a neat little thing to carry around Well, one of the things that amuses me here in August of the year 2020 is only after a couple of years of working on this have I got to the point where I can more confidently say that the machine will perform like I want it to if I was to go out in public. And going out in public is kind of the whole point of having an ultra portable typewriter, especially one with such a nice case, right? But it's the year 2020. <laughs> Right. So for the time being, I probably won't be going out to my nearest coffee shop, unfortunately, but I will take it out to the patio, the backyard, various places, take it over to my friend Kevin's on his front porch where we can sit out in the open air and uh, safely type. I really love this machine and uh, I hope you guys are loving your typewriters if you have typewriters in your collection. If you don't, if you're just curious about typewriters and you've been watching this channel for a while, maybe I would suggest uh, maybe you ought to find yourself a typewriter and get on the bandwagon. Typewriters are fun. They really are. Well, this is Joe. I encourage you guys, stay creative, stay well. Have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye for now.